Hello, everyone. I thought that maybe I'd introduce myself and say a little bit about where I am at the moment. This is an odd situation that we're in, of course, a bizarre situation with this pandemic. We're all kind of on these Zoom webinars and Blue Jeans webinars and the like. We're all kind of in each other's personal space, but we're not. We're very distant from each other at the same time. So just to try to make this a little bit more informal, I thought I'd show you a quick picture of where I am right at the moment. Liliana says I should start and uh, I should ask people to send their questions via the Q&A or Q&R box and she will select uh, select the, uh, the questions for me to see at the end of my talk. I'll try to make sure there's enough time for us to have a good conversation. We have about 90 to 100 participants at this point. So uh, let me just share my screen. I'm on, a, on Southern Vancouver Island, talking to people I know from all across, the, uh, all across uh, North America, Canada, North America, perhaps around the world. I want to show you the, what I'm looking at right now, just beyond my screen. So uh, Southern Vancouver Island, Southwest Vancouver Island, about 20 kilometers outside of the city of Victoria. This is looking across the Juan de Fuca Straits. Those mountains in the distance are Washington State, the Olympic Mountains, uh, some of the highest mountains in Western North America. And, uh, and there's about 20 kilometer stretch of water beyond that point that you see in the foreground off uh, on the other side of that point before the mountains. So this is a, a property that's been in the family for about 40 years and I'm in a little cabin on the cliff, as you can see, uh, looking out across the ocean. And, uh, and this is where I've written my books for the last 30 years or so, including my latest one, which will be out this August on hope. It's titled Commanding Hope, uh, The Power We Have to Renew a World in Peril. And it speaks directly to the issues we're going to talk about today. So I have been based at uh, the University of Toronto and the University of Waterloo for uh, almost three decades and recently moved <clears throat> back to my hometown of Victoria to uh, found and get underway this new institute, the Cascade Institute. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes, uh, but it, it uh, uh, focuses directly on the kinds of challenges we're facing today, especially the connections between, uh, between systems and how we can perhaps leverage those connections or understand them better in ways that can help us as a species prosper on this planet more effectively. We're really facing an enormous number of extraordinary challenges as a species right at the moment. Of course, the one that's most on our minds, the one that is, is uh, in the forefront of our consciousness right now is the pandemic. But there are a host of other Enormously, ser enormously serious global challenges, including, of course, climate change, which is now starting to cause very substantial visible changes in our environment around us, including widespread wildfires and forests and the smoke that accompanies those. Many of us have experienced those problems uh, around the world now, most recently, of course, in Australia. These are, this is a fire in the Okanagan in 2017 one of the driest summers on record in British Columbia. So threats to our well-being as a species are now multiplying and combining in force. And uh, these bullets just list some of them, some of the ones that are probably most important. First of all, uh, there's human population growth. Uh, we are at around 7.5 billion people on the planet, heading towards somewhere around 10 to 11 billion. And the real challenge with human population growth is uh, the damage that the human population as a whole does to its environment because of the number of people who are consuming and, uh, and uh, emitting waste into the natural environment. But in particular, the demographic imbalances around the world between those parts of the world's population that are still growing very fast and those parts where the population growth is starting to decline very rapidly. So we're seeing the stabilization of population growth in East Asia, China, but we're still seeing significant population growth in South, South Asia, uh, Southwest Asia, 
uh, Middle East, North Africa, and throughout Africa. And these imbalances drive very large migrations around the world, which are, are uh, stressing uh, uh, many societies in serious ways. On top of that, we have worsening instabilities in key natural systems, such as the Earth's climate. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, very serious crisis of biodiversity uh, in, in across all kinds of plants and animals, uh, fish, uh, large mammals, all mammal populations, birds, uh, insect populations. And we don't really understand what the implications of this decline in biodiversity is and what and how it may hurt us, how that climate decline in biodiversity may hurt us economically and socially in coming decades. Uh, of course, we're facing a, a, a worldwide pandemic of COVID-19 at the moment. And these uh, four changes, as well as others, are producing enormous economic stress, financial shocks, and extreme and growing inequalities of wealth and opportunity within and between our societies. And all of these things are happening simultaneously. And in some cases, they reinforce each other's impact. In really, in really serious ways that hurt people, large numbers, billions of people. Let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. This is data I downloaded last night, just showing the, uh, the total of coronavirus cases around the world right now. Uh, you can see that it's a linear progression, uh, adding pretty steadily about 75 to 100,000 new cases a day. The data are very soft. It, particularly because a lot of the reporting is from parts of the world where, where uh, uh, testing is not widespread. So we actually, we actually don't know uh, what the total caseload in the world is. It's quite possible that the actual number of infections exceed this documented total by at least tenfold and perhaps as much as 50-fold. Tenfold would mean uh, we have four, 40 to 50 million people on the planet who are actually who have been or are currently infected with COVID-19. So the question that we ask in the Cascade Institute and that I'm talking about today in part is how could this COVID-19 pandemic have knock-on effects, very much like a row of falling dominoes, affecting other systems that are closely related, the economy, the global energy system, uh, perhaps the food system, and ultimately perhaps affecting social order and the survival of democracy, uh, liberal democracy around the planet. What are the possible connections there? It seems to us within the Cascade Institute that these connections are very much worth investigating. And we have some tools that can try to see these tipping point effects more, more accurately and understand where we're going. We're already seeing uh, significant effects on the economy, of course. Uh, there have been shocks within global energy systems, including the uh, uh, fossil fuel, especially petroleum uh, supply and demand around the world, uh, which has caused, again, a, 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 a re reinforcing or reciprocal effect back to the economy as energy prices, uh, oil prices have collapsed. It's threatened the bankruptcy of large numbers of petroleum firms around the world. Uh, uh, food prices in some parts of the world are soaring because of supply chain breakdowns, grain prices, for example, uh, affecting the availability of food for many people around the world and affecting especially those who are uh, in marginal circumstances and can't afford higher food prices. And then we've also seen uh, some uh, regimes that were leaning authoritarian around the world take advantage of this crisis to try to reinforce their authoritarian, authoritarian power Perhaps the best example is in Hungary, Viktor Orban has uh, used this opportunity to essentially establish a, 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 a dictatorship in the country and, uh, and roll back democratic freedoms substantially. So we know at least anecdotally that there are some important relations between the COVID-19 pandemic and all of these other systems, but the job now is to trace out those relations and understand them better so that we can uh, perhaps figure out what to do in response. So the Cascade Institute is specifically dedicated to developing this kind of understanding. And in particular, we want to, we want to uh, identify opportunities for positive cascades as opposed to just negative ones. The one that we saw in the last slide that 
those knock-on effects were clearly negative in terms of their implications for human beings. But the Cascade Institute is also interested in trying to identify positive cascading, uh, cascading effects, what we would call virtuous cascades in cognitive, institutional, and technological systems around the world. We look for high leverage intervention points that could shift global civilization away from a path that leads to calamity and towards one that leads to fair and sustainable prosperity. The idea here is to understand the systems around us, these belief systems, the institutional systems, and the technological systems well enough that we can see where their tipping point possibilities may be, where if we push things a little bit uh, in one direction, we might be able to cause a virtuous cascade of change that could benefit large numbers of people. <clears throat> so the Cascade Institute uh, has two, I guess you could say, scientific pillars or underneath it are two uh, underlying scientific foundations. The first is what we call, uh, it's a conceptual apparatus that we call the WIT analysis, which stands for worldviews, institutions, and technologies. <clears throat> We're very interested in how these three things link together, how people's belief systems affect the, their understanding of institutions and reinforce institutions around them where institutions are sort of the rules of the road, not just organizations, but the principles by which people govern their behavior and understand how other people should govern their behavior. And also the technologies we use in our world, uh, everything from uh, internal combustion engines to the electrical power grids we have to the ways we grow food. And it turns out that worldviews, institutions, and technologies are very closely linked together. And you can't really change one without changing the others effectively. And so we do an analysis that crosses all three of these areas simultaneously. And our second scientific foundation is complexity science. Now, to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it's a very uh, large field with many different sort of sub-disciplines within it. But three key concepts that that uh, are at the heart of our analysis are three key, I guess you could say, phenomena uh, that are at the heart of our analysis. Is the high are the high causal interactions within the systems we look at. So lots of things affecting lots of other things simultaneously. And then feedback loops. These are causal loops where if a change in a system produces a series of other changes that either reinforces or dampens the original change. If it reinforces the original change, that's called a positive feedback loop. If it dampens or counteracts the original change, that's called a negative feedback loop. And these feedback loops, tracing them out, turns out to be enormously important because they contribute, uh, along with high causal interaction, to tipping events within systems. Small events can turn out to have very big impacts when they're amplified by feedback loops. And I'll talk about a few examples as we move forward in this presentation. <clears throat> but those three, three key concepts, high causal interaction, feedback loops, and nonlinear behavior or tipping events are at the core of our analysis. This idea of nonlinear behavior simply means that a system has what's called disproportional causation. Small events can sometimes cause very big changes, and sometimes really big events in a system don't seem to make much difference at all. So there's no proportionality between the size of a cause and the size of its effect. That makes predicting the behavior of these systems extremely difficult. So complex systems are all around us. They include systems that don't have any living components, such as uh, the atmosphere, as you can see in the clouds on the left side here. The atmosphere and the climate system associated with it are, are complex systems. Uh, and you have living systems uh, living complex systems. I've shown a photograph of a, uh, a, uh, a rainforest here. Uh, these are what complexity scientists would call complex adaptive systems, unlike the, uh, the weather system and the climate, which doesn't have any living components, at least in its narrow definition. Uh, the rainforest is full of living components, and those living components the organisms and species have the ability to adapt to changing environment through either evolution or sometimes by changing their behavior. And that's a very important difference. And then finally, we have human complex, complex adaptive systems, which uh, where human beings have the ability to represent their external world 
in their minds and then manipulate those representations, their essentially beliefs or worldviews about what's happening around them. So we call those complex adaptive representational systems. And they're a whole new order, qualitatively different in terms of complexity. Uh, on the left, we see the connectivity that we have introduced into the world, which of course has produced enormous prosperity around the world in some ways through trade and commerce, but also has allowed things like the SARS-CoV-2 virus to spread, spread rapidly around the planet. Definitely both positive and negative effects to that connectivity. And on the right-hand side, we see a trader in mid-March uh, uh, responding to the collapse of markets because of the pandemic. Uh, a, an ideational system created within our minds uh, representing the wealth of different goods and services around the planet. And you can see in the background that wealth is collapsing rapidly on the screen, uh, obviously causing him some stress. So from a complex systems perspective, using some of these tools I've just talked about, what can the pandemic teach us? Well, I think that there are three key lessons. Uh, one is uh, and, and we've learned these very viscerally in a very personal way in the last, last couple of months. Uh, highly connected and uniform systems, social systems can flip abruptly to radically new states. We've seen that in an extraordinary way in our personal lives just in the last couple of months. So social systems are susceptible to tipping events. And these tipping events can generate cascades of impacts into other systems. So we started with a public health problem with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic, and that uh, immediately generated enormous impacts within our economies. And then those impacts within our economies are affecting energy systems and food systems. And we don't really understand exactly how those tipping events or cascades of intersystemic impacts are going to are going to work out. And that gets to our third point, which is that we face a kind of epistemic blindness that our conventional theories, models, and policies can't effectively explain or predict to these behaviors or guide our policy responses to them. We really, with our, with our standard ways of looking at the world, we're not able to cope effectively with, uh, with sudden tipping events. We can't predict them. We actually don't know what their consequences are going to be. And we don't have a good grasp of what the intersystemic impacts multiple systems might be. So it's like we, we don't have uh, any kind of uh, tools to see effectively what's going on. And that's partly what the Cascade Institute is about, is an attempt to make sure we have the tools to see better around us. I think all three of these lessons apply to the climate crisis. Uh, and, and, and so the analog is very important. The planet's climate has the capacity to shift abruptly to a radically new state in response to self-reinforcing feedbacks. Of course, climate scientists have been talking about this kind of thing for years, but it's always seemed rather abstract to, I think, most people. And now it seems a lot less abstract because we've actually seen what a tipping event can look like and how dramatic the effects in our lives can be. Uh, then in the second bullet, recent research highlights the risk of tipping cascades and impacts across multiple systems. I'm going to talk about that research in just a moment. And then finally, just as with the pandemic, we are in a situation where we really can't anticipate effectively what's going to happen. We don't know where these tipping events or cascades of effects could occur in time or space. So let's talk a little bit about climate change because I think many people on this call are going to be very interested in, in this challenge and, and are interested in the, in the potential relationship between the pandemic and climate change. You've probably seen slides like this before, but it's always good to have a reminder of just how serious our situation is. This is a, a slide representing the change in temperature on the surface of the earth going back to the end of the last ice age. So this is basically the, the Holocene epoch from 11,300 years ago to the present. We can see that during this period of time, the temperature of the planet, the surface of the planet has varied about 0 0.7 degrees Celsius. And in the last 2000 years, the period of time during which humankind has laid down its infrastructure of modern human civilization, its ports, its roads, its major cities, its agricultural systems, its irrigation systems, 
uh, the temperature has varied about 0 0.5 degrees. It's been a relatively benign climate environment. And we're now well outside that envelope. We've already warmed the planet so that we're outside the envelope of temperatures that has existed during the entire evolution of modern human civilization. And we're going to a world that is truly radically different, where, where uh, it, it's quite likely that not only will most ecosystems in the world not be able to adapt, but most human societies won't be able to adapt especially given the rapidity of change, which in a geological time frame, as you can see here, is almost instantaneous. The line is almost vertical. And there's very little doubt that we're going at least to two degrees Celsius, and we're probably heading, quite likely heading to something like three or even four degrees by the end of the century. So as Stefan Ramsdorf, a German climate scientist says, we are catapult catapulting ourselves way out of the Holocene epoch. If humanity stays on its current trajectory, we will not recognize our Earth by the end of the century. So let me go through a couple of imp uh, three important scientific findings that have come out just in the last few months that gives you a sense for the gravity of this situation and talks a little bit about some of these issues of feedbacks and cascading impacts. Uh, the first is uh, uh, a report that came out of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration uh, at the end of uh, last year that looked at the Arctic. It's called the Arctic Report Card. And the most important finding, the thing that really struck climate scientists and others watching climate science in this report was the information on what's happening in terms of the release of carbon from the Arctic now. Just, so just to quote, the report says that new regional and winter season measurements of ecosystem carbon dioxide flux independently indicate that permafrost region ecosystems are releasing a net carbon amount of uh, somewhere around 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 uh, billion tons of carbon per year. That's petagrams, but it converts into uh, billion tons. So about 600 million tons of carbon per year to the atmosphere. These observations, and this is the punchline, signify that the feedback to accelerating climate change may already be underway. In other words, as the Arctic warms, it's now starting to release a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. And that carbon is amplifying warming. That's the kind of positive feedback that many climate scientists have been very concerned could start to develop, and it appears to be developing in the Arctic. The second report that I highlight came out just a little bit before the Arctic report card. And this looked at the possibility of cascading tipping points across the climate system. And uh, again, this got an enormous amount of attention, very worrisome. And these folks said that the clearest emergency, climate emergency, would be if we were approaching a global cascade of tipping points that led to a new, less habitable, hothouse climate state. We argue that cascading effects might be common and examples are starting to be observed. And to give you a sense for what they were talking about, they were suggesting that there are these, in, these places in the world, uh, so you can see at the top, Arctic sea ice reduction, having an arrow towards increasing uh, boreal forest fires on the left-hand side, and uh, increasing pest infestations in boreal forests, also affecting the loss of the Greenland ice sheet. So each one of these little circles, orange circles, is a possible tipping point in the climate system. And as they tip, they may affect other tipping point possibilities, as you can see in terms of the connections of the arrows. And this is, a, this is something that hasn't been thought about a huge amount within the, the climate community, but is now getting attention that changes in the Arctic could cause cascades of changes all the way down, as you can see, to the West Arctic, Antarctic ice sheet down at the bottom of the chart. They say in conclusion that the evidence from tipping points alone suggests that we are in a state of planetary emergency. And then the final of the three reports I wanna highlight looks at cascading effects into food production around the world. And these authors look at the possibility that we could face simultaneous breadbasket failures in major food producing regions, such as in Australia, Europe, China, and North America if even two of those areas confronts a serious drought or climate emergency for one or two years in a row, uh, that could have an enormous impact on food production around the world, potentially 
causing food prices to increase very rapidly and causing enormous uh, food crises and hunger, especially in poor populations around the world. So to quote them again, to this, uh, this third article, we combine region-specific data on agricultural production with spatial statistics of climate extremes to quantify the changing risk of low production for the major food producing regions or bread baskets over time. We show an increasing risk of simultaneous failure of wheat, maize, and soybean crops across the bread baskets analyzed. So all of this suggests that we are facing another potential series of knock-on effects from climate change. Uh, similar to what we were looking at with COVID-19. And in fact, climate change and COVID-19 could interact in important ways. And I'll talk about an example of that in, the moment, in a moment that could be very powerful and destabilizing. If we're going to try to avert these crises, as Will Stephan, a, a renowned ecologist in Australia has said, we need to reach a social tipping point before we reach a planetary one. And I'll focus in the last few minutes of my talk on how this might happen. The Cascade Institute to address these issues has two current projects. The first is to actually trace out these, inter, these potentially dangerous intersystemic cascades. We are looking at uh, eight major systems, as you can see around this octagon, and we're focusing in particular on three, the economy, energy, and food systems, but in the context of the other five systems that are not highlighted there. And just to give you an example of the kind of thing we're investigating now, one of the, one of the effects of the pandemic has been, as you can see on the left-hand side, this is a photograph from New Delhi, uh, a dramatic clearing of the air. Well, one of the things that happens with the clearing of the air is a lot more solar radiation falls on the surface of the planet. So in a a paradoxical way, the COVID-19 crisis could be having a series of consequences that could actually accelerate warming, at least temporarily, while, we, while there's less pollution in the atmosphere. The chain of events would look something like this. The pandemic leads to a decrease in economic activity, which leads to a decrease in the combustion of fossil fuels, as you can see in New Delhi there, reducing the atmospheric sulfate load, which increases the amount of radiation at the surface of the planet, and then could potentially increase problems such as Northern Hemisphere forest fires, and the smoke released from those forest fires could interact with the respiratory problems from the ongoing pandemic could, to accelerate the economic impact of the pandemic. So that's the kind of interaction effect that is not getting a lot of attention in our current in, in much research or com public commentary at the moment, and it's something that the Cascade Institute is specifically focusing on. Just to give you a sense for how these connections would work, we start with an impact on the health system through the pandemic that affects the economy and uh, especially the consumption of uh, fossil fuel energy, combustion of, of uh, hydrocarbons and the release of uh, and the release of uh, pollution into the atmosphere. So we go from the health system to the economic system, to the energy system, changes in the release of combustion products, uh, pollution into the atmosphere, uh, in turn affects the, the uh, ecological system, the climate system specifically, and the change in that climate system through the increasing radiative forcing potentially causes more fires and that in turn affects uh, people's health. And it's just a set of connections that can be traced out. Uh, it may turn out that this is not a particularly serious problem, but it, it certainly seems to be worth investigating. But it's important to emphasize, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, that these kinds of cascading changes in our global systems don't have to be pernicious. They might be virtuous. They might help us prosper better in the future. And I think that today's COVID-19 pandemic could help catalyze an urgently needed tipping event in humanity's collective moral values, its priorities, and sense of self and community. It could remind us, and I think it is reminding us, of our common fate on a small, crowded planet with dwindling resources and fraying natural systems. So in our second project, immediate project under the, under the auspices of the Cascade Institute. We're trying to identify exactly these possibilities for rapid belief system change. 
we released a technical paper just a, a short time ago that looks in particular at the kind of what we would call norm cascade or change in normative behavior surrounding social distancing, something, a term that none of us were familiar with as recently as say three or four months ago, but now everybody understands and we have implemented that behavior in substantial ways in our, in our lives, not just because we're told to do it, because, but also because most of us believe that it's the right thing to do. And that has happened simultaneously in societies around the world, an extraordinary change in behavior, very quick. And you wonder whether there are mechanisms behind that change that might tell us something about how norm cascades or normative change could occur that could for instance, accelerate the shift to zero carbon technologies that could change people's attitudes towards climate change and accelerate the move towards actually responding effectively to climate change. Are there norm cascades possible in that domain? And that's the kind of thing we're thinking about right now. So a complex systems approach thinks about the world in terms of multiple equilibria, multiple stable states. And one of the, the metaphors we use is what's called an energy landscape. It's sort of this idea of a ball on, uh, on, a, on a, a, a topography that has a lot of basins in it. If you hit the ball hard enough, it rolls up to the top of, uh, of, the, of the cliff and perhaps even eventually pops over into another basin, another basin, what's called a basin of attraction or equilibrium point. Notice that two things can cause the, the system to shift from one state to another, from one equilibrium to another. You can have a shallowing of the basin uh, because of long-term pressures that make the system less stable, the equilibrium less stable. And then you have a shock to the system that causes it to pop from one place to another, sort of approximate cause of some kind. The pandemic is clearly a proximate shock uh, to our systems. The question is whether there are possibilities of moving into other equilibria. The, uh, the, cli the climate or complexity scientists think in terms of very complex landscapes, energy landscapes with lots of different basins, a lot of which we probably can't see. Uh, we, we might have a sense for where they are, but we don't know how easy or difficult it is to get from one place to another. I think one way of characterizing the situation we're in right now globally is that we are on the cusp between two basins of attraction, two equilibrium points. One that could represent social, that would be characterized by social, deep social division, and one that would be characterized by social solidarity. Um, I thank my daughter, Kate, who's 12, for these emoticons to represent the different emotional states of the two different uh, uh, belief system or worldview basins of attraction. And I think it's an open question right at the moment which way we're going to go. There are clear expressions of both in the world today of division. These folks gathered on the, uh, the legislature steps in the state of Michigan in the United States to protest social distancing and, and uh, measures to reduce the spread of the pandemic. Uh, and at the same time, we see around the world uh, people applauding the, the uh, heroic measures of uh, health care professionals uh, a statement of enormous solidarity. And, and we have, in many respects, pulled together very effectively around the world in response to the challenges we're facing uh, with, in, the, in the context of the pandemic. And uh, it's not at all clear which way we're going to go. I would say that the Trump administration, in particular Trump, uh, President Trump, is very busily trying to push us into the division basin of attraction, whereas there are many folks, of course, other leaders around the world who are trying to solve the problem by increasing social solidarity. The pandemic offers us opportunities for enhancing solidarity. And I'd just like to conclude with, with uh, these three ideas. I think the focus of the economic recovery, if it's focused on transforming, the, uh, transforming our economy and its underlying energy systems in ways that can allow us to respond more effectively to climate change, that could be uh, a way of bringing us together around an important project that could uh, improve our prosperity in the future. In the context of Canada, I think it's very important that the rest of the country reach out to uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan to try to work with those provinces to, uh, to uh, help those provinces find a new economic pathway uh, 
because it's very clear with the collapse in oil prices that uh, their futures as fossil fuel extractors are probably limited and it's time to to move to new energy systems but that's a project not just for those provinces it's a project for the provinces for the country as a whole for canada as a whole uh, and and it can be a a project that brings us together that enhances social solidarity i think too, the pandemic has enhanced the credibility and legitimacy of scientists and experts and it's increased the support for expert endorsed climate action i think that uh, we have recognized the importance of these experts in guiding us through a crisis such as the pandemic. And that, of course, can uh, perhaps enhance the uh, legitimacy of science in the context of the climate crisis. And then finally, the pandemic demonstrates that effective rapid action by government is possible. The government doesn't always just get in the way or isn't a, 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 a parasite a sucking wealth and uh, uh, and opportunity out of our economy. So the pandemic challenges arguments that government action around climate change is politically infeasible. It, uh, if, if the governments have, have helped us, it's seen it helped us uh, move effectively through this pandemic crisis, as I think in Canada, we could say the governments have, for the most part, uh, aided our response really substantially and we're better off with the advice and, and direction and regulation that we've received then the, uh, uh, the same could well be true in the context of climate change. The government action could be important and very useful there. And in all three of these ways, the pandemic provides uh, a context in which we could potentially enhance social solidarity in Canada. And that's the end of my presentation. So thanks to these uh, uh, groups and funders who have supported the Cascade Institute to this point. And I think we have a few minutes for chatting and questions still. Let me stop the sharing. So at this point, I think I go to the Q&A box. And this is a question from Ron. So as a consequence of this pandemic, if we focus on factors related to human behavior, behavior, what are some hopeful practices that are emerging within, within our global systems that should be encouraged to continue post-pandemic? Perhaps the current pandemic may not be cajoling humanity to rapidly advance carbon neutral sustenance as we may like at this point. However, we benefit from other hopeful examples. Uh, and then uh, Robin has asked, would it be possible to get a copy of the presentation? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, just to go back to Ron's question, I, I tried to highlight some of these hopeful possibilities at the end of my presentation. Uh, I think uh, I think we now understand very much better the relationship between the enormous throughput in our economies and, for instance, carbon output. So we've seen the largest declines in carbon output globally uh, uh, in, you know, since the Second World War uh, as a result of this economic downturn. And so that raises some real questions about, frankly, the relationship between economic growth and the way we've structured our economies and our climate crisis. I think one of the things that probably a lot of us are reconsidering right now is whether it's really necessary for us all to travel quite as much as we have. We've developed these new technologies and we're practicing with these new technologies of remote communication. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there may be a, quite a number of ways in which we can reduce our energy consumption without necessarily reducing our overall wealth. But perhaps we find ultimately, and this is perhaps a hopeful consequence, it's certainly been in my life, that, that we'd enjoy being a little bit less uh, busy in terms of physical movement, uh, staying uh, staying closer to home, perhaps providing more opportunity for reflection, a little bit of slack in our lives, because we haven't had a lot of slack in our lives in the past. And I think all of us, or many of us, especially those of us who haven't faced enormous economic crises as a result of lost jobs and such, and of course many of us have, but, we, but we've uh, felt that the uh, opportunity to slow down a bit perhaps has been a, a bit a blessing and a benefit. Um, 
So a uh, question from Margie Mendel. How do we move from a situational expression of solidarity to embedding this behavior and how we design our future? So that's a really important question. Uh, the, the, I think that there is a, an important relationship that we don't really understand between our emotional response to challenges like this and our moral response. And it's, it's understanding that connection that would allow us to embed. Less than a minute. Yes, okay, so I need to finish up. It's understanding that connection between uh, the emotional and the moral response that would be very important. So the fear tends to produce division, uh, but it can also motivate that's the kind of solidarity we pull together to respond to the problem. But the question then is, uh, how do we see that morally? What, what is that pulling together? How is that understood in terms of the, the uh, uh, the, the oughts or the moral principles we lead our lives by. And I, so the fear response might cause us morally to feel we need to defend our group. Uh, but it might also cause us morally to feel that the principle we need to live by is something like the golden rule, that we need to treat each other the way we, we want to be treated ourselves. And the connection between the moral principles that we adopt and the emotions is not well understand understood and if we can understand that better I think we can embed our expression of solidarity uh, more permanently in our behavior and that's something the Cascade Institute is trying to understand better now. Thank you.